Let's investigate the quantum LC circuit. First, let's write down the Lagrangian in classical mechanics, which describes a circuit consisting of a capacitor and an inductor. I'm going to use fancy L to denote the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian consists of two terms. The first term involves the capacitance times the time derivative of the magnetic flux squared all over 2. And then we need to subtract the magnetic flux squared over 2L. So this C is the capacitance, and this L is the inductance. We have a term that is analogous to the kinetic energy and another term which is analogous to the potential energy. So we have kinetic minus potential. That is our Lagrangian. So you can see where uh, this is actually coming from. Why is this related to the harmonic oscillator? We have a Lagrangian that has a similar form. Instead of the position coordinate, we're using magnetic flux as our coordinate. And this time derivative of the magnetic flux is behaving like velocity. Capacitance is actually behaving like mass would if we had a mass on a spring. And this inductance is kind of behaving like the properties of the spring. So 1 over the inductance would be analogous to k. So k would actually be multiplying the position squared if we were dealing with the simple harmonic oscillator. Now let's write down the canonically conjugate coordinate. This would be momentum if we were dealing with position over here. But it's not momentum in this case. It is the charge. And I'm going to denote the charge by capital Q. So this canonically conjugate coordinate is equal to the partial derivative with respect to phi dot of the Lagrangian. And that is equal to C times phi dot. So how did I get this? Well, I just used the power rule, and I brought this 2 down, and it cancelled with the half. So this is the canonically conjugate coordinate, where it's the charge conjugate to the flux. Now, let's write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. This has a time derivative of this quantity that we just described over here. The partial derivative with respect to phi dot of the Lagrangian. That's the left-hand side of the equation. And this is all equal to the partial derivative with respect to phi of the Lagrangian. So that is the Euler-Lagrange equation. And it's going to give us the equation of motion if we substitute our Lagrangian into this differential equation. So the equation of motion is going to have the following form. We're going to have phi double dot, that's the second time derivative, is equal to minus omega squared times phi. And what is this omega squared? Well, omega can actually be defined in the following way. Omega can be written in terms of L and C. It is the reciprocal of the square root of the product of the inductance and the capacitance. That's a bit of a mouthful. It's the reciprocal of the square root of the product of the inductance and the capacitance. So we take L and C, which are parameters that physically correspond to the properties of the capacitor and the inductor in the circuit, and we can use those guys together to tune omega. And omega is that frequency of oscillation. It's the angular frequency of oscillation. So how do we get this from the Euler-Lagrange equation? Well, if you substitute this q inside over here, inside these brackets, you're just going to be taking the time derivative of this expression. And that's going to introduce another dot above this capital phi. That's because phi denotes a time derivative. So we're going to have c phi double dot. And on the right-hand side, we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to phi. So that is taking the partial derivative of this term with respect to phi. So we just use the power rule. That cancels this 1 half. And we're just left with minus phi on L. Then we can take that C and bring it down into the denominator on the right-hand side. And then we have minus 1 on LC. And that can be uh, reassigned to this value over here, omega squared. So we know omega squared is the same as 1 over LC. And then we just have to take the square root, and we can find omega. So this is the second order ordinary differential equation that describes the simple harmonic oscillator. The only difference over here is that we're dealing with phi, the magnetic flux, instead of a position coordinate. So this is what Lagrangian mechanics 
has given us in the classical understanding of this system. Now let's move over to Hamiltonian mechanics. In Hamiltonian mechanics, we want to write the Hamiltonian. So how do we get the Hamiltonian from the Lagrangian? We have to take the Legendre transform. So I'll write down the Legendre transform. Capital H denotes the Hamiltonian, and that is equal to the Legendre transform. We need this Q, the canonically conjugate coordinate, and we also need phi dot. So these two quantities are analogous to momentum and velocity. We have the time derivative of a coordinate that is analogous to the velocity. And then we have to subtract the Lagrangian, fancy L. So make sure you distinguish this L from this L. This normal capital L is the inductance, and this fancy L is the Lagrangian. So when we perform this Legendre transform by substituting this relationship in here, what we're going to do is we're actually going to change this minus sign to a plus sign. So we're going to get kinetic plus potential. So that's going to be equal to C phi dot squared over 2 plus phi squared over 2L. So the only difference over here is the sign in between these two guys. It's the sign of the potential energy function. But we can also make another change. We can change this expression and write it in terms of Q. So that's going to give us Q squared over 2C plus phi squared over 2L. So we've just written this in terms of the canonically conjugate coordinate. This is in terms of charge and magnetic flux. And you can see there's a nice symmetric relationship. We have a quadratic function divided by some constant and another quadratic function divided by another constant. So this term is associated with the capacitor, and this term is associated with the inductor. Now, let's use Hamilton's equations. So first, let's have a look at phi dot. What is the time evolution of that magnetic flux? Well, phi dot is equal to the partial derivative with respect to Q of the Hamiltonian. And what is that going to be? We just use the power rule, and we get Q over C. Now let's have a look at the time derivative of Q. So Q dot. Q dot is equal to minus the partial derivative with respect to phi of the Hamiltonian. And that's equal to, we're going, again we have to use the power rule for differentiation, and that's going to give us minus phi over L. So now we have two first order differential equations. Up here in Lagrangian mechanics, the Euler-Lagrange equation gave us a second order differential equation. Now we've split that second order differential equation into two first order differential equations. One for phi and one for q. So we have phi dot and q dot. These are Hamilton's equations. You can see that they are almost symmetric. They're not quite symmetric because of this minus sign. There's a minus sign over here, and over here we have a plus sign. So all of these equations over here have been using a condensed notation. So this is a condensed notation for the partial derivative. And you can see uh, it's, it's a lot more convenient to write this condensed notation, especially when we have a lot of partial derivatives coming around the place. So now what I want to do is I'm going to write the Poisson bracket. The Poisson bracket of phi with q. That's what I'm interested in. So let's have a look at the Poisson bracket. This curvy bracket over here is going to denote the Poisson bracket. We have phi, and then we have q. I'm going to write out the definition of the Poisson bracket. First, we have to take a partial derivative with respect to phi of phi, and then we have to multiply that by the partial derivative with respect to q of q, and then we subtract, over, uh, subtract off the swapped over version. So we need to swap phi and q around. So we're going to have the partial derivative with respect to phi of q, and then we'll have the partial derivative with respect to q of phi. So that's what we have over here. You can see that I've kept the derivatives in the same order. We have phi, q, phi, q, but I've swapped around these guys. We have phi over here, then q over here, and then q, and then phi. So what is this going to be equal to? Well, these guys are independent variables. So when we take the derivative of q with respect to phi, or phi with respect to q, we're going to get 0, 
both of these terms are zero. But here we have the derivative of phi with respect to itself and the derivative of q with respect to itself. Both of these derivatives are going to be equal to 1. So we have 1 times 1 minus 0 times 0. That is equal to 1. And this is very important. This is just like taking the Poisson bracket of a position and momentum in classical mechanics. So all of this so far has been classical mechanics. Now let's translate the language of Hamiltonian mechanics into quantum mechanics. So I'm going to write the commutator. So over here we have the Poisson bracket. Now I'm going to write the commutator. We're going to have the commutator of these operator quantities. So now I'm going to turn these guys into operators. Phi now has a hat because it's an operator. And Q has a hat because it's an operator. And I'll write out this definition of the operator, uh, of the, definition, the definition of the commutator of these guys. So first we're going to have phi, then we're going to have q, and then we're going to subtract off q and then phi. So you can see it's the same pattern that we saw in the Poisson bracket, just there's no derivatives involved over here. We have phi q minus q phi, phi q minus q phi. And this is equal to i h bar. So we have i h bar over here. And this is actually the canonical commutation relation. It's just like the commutator of the position and momentum operators. This is equal to i h bar. And implicitly, we have the identity operator here. Because all of these guys on the left hand side are operators. So on the right hand side, this also has to be an operator. The identity operator is implied. Now I'm going to write down one more commutation relation, which is important. And that's the commutation relation between the ladder operators. So we have A and A dagger. So I'll write this out in full. We have A, A dagger minus A dagger A. And that is equal to 1. So this is another important commutation relation which we'll be using. So first we have A, A dagger, and then we're subtracting off A dagger A. And this dagger over here denotes the Hermitian adjoint, or the Hermitian conjugate. Let me write down uh, the definitions of A and A dagger. And then we're actually going to use them and, uh, to, to write the Hamiltonian. We're going to express the Hamiltonian in terms of these guys. So let's write down what A is. A is equal to this following mess. We're going to have a constant out the front. It's a big square root, square root of 1 over 2 h bar z, and z over here is actually the impedance. And we'll talk more about this impedance later in the video. Then we want to multiply all of this by this operator phi plus i times the impedance times q. So you can see I'm, I'm writing hats above phi and q over here because they have been turned into operators. Now I want to find a dagger. So I'm going to take the Hermitian conjugate of this, or the Hermitian adjoint. So I'll write that underneath. We have a dagger. All of these guys are real numbers out the front. So this is not going to get changed. We're still going to have the square root of 1 over 2 h bar capital Z, which is the impedance. But what's going to happen over here? The Hermitian conjugate of phi and q is not going to change. Them. That's because these are Hermitian operators. Why are they Hermitian operators? Well, they are physical observables. And physical observables in quantum mechanics correspond to Hermitian operators. Hermitian operators, by definition, are equal to their Hermitian adjoint. So if we take the dagger and we apply it to these guys, it's not going to change anything. Phi is equal to phi dagger. Q is equal to Q dagger. But this i over here is going to get changed. It's going to change to minus i, because we're going to have to take the complex conjugate. So I'll write that underneath. We have phi with a hat minus i z q. So that's the only difference between a and a dagger. It is just the sign of this imaginary number over here. So we have plus i and minus i. Now what we want to do is write phi and q in terms of the ladder operators. So first of all, let's take the sum of these two quantities. Let's take the sum of a dagger and a. So we want to add these guys together. What's that going to give us? Well, if we add these guys together, we have a minus sign over here and a plus sign. So these terms are going to cancel. There's not going to be any Q 
And we're going to have two copies of this pi. That's going to give us 2 times pi. And we also need to multiply by all of this coefficient over here. So we have the coefficient square root of 1 over 2 h bar z. And now what we want to do is we want to isolate this phi. So I'm going to isolate that phi and write it over here on the right. So all we have to do is we have to bring in this 2 inside the square root, and that's going to become a 4, and it's going to cancel with this 2 over here, and it's just going to have a 2 in the top. And then we need to take the reciprocal and move this over to the other side. So that's going to give us phi hat is equal to the square root of h bar z over 2 times the sum of a dagger and a. So it's important that we have the sum over here and z is in the top. So z was on the bottom over here, but now it's moved to the top because we've taken the reciprocal. Now let's take the difference of these two operators. Let's take a dagger minus a. What is that going to give us? Well, if we subtract these guys, we're going to introduce a minus sign to a. So we're going to have minus phi over here, and we're also going to have a minus in front of this i. So we're going to have phi and minus phi. So the phi's are going to cancel. There's not going to be any phi remaining. But we will have a minus sign over here, so we're going to have two copies of this term. So we're going to have minus 2i z q. So that's two copies of this with a minus sign over here. And then we have that square root at the front. So we have the square root of 1 over 2 h bar z. So that is what we get. Now let's isolate for this q. So all we have to do is bring in this 2z. You can bring that in here. It's going to become 2z all squared. And one of those factors of 2z is going to cancel with this 2z over here. And so we're going to have h bar in the bottom and 2z in the top. And then when we move it to the other side, we have to take the reciprocal. But we can't forget this minus i over here. When we move this minus i to the other side, it's going to turn into plus i. That's because minus i is the reciprocal of plus i. So let's write that over here. We're going to get q is equal to i times the square root of h bar over 2z times a dagger minus a. So that is what we have now. So we have an expression for phi and an expression for q in terms of all these ladder operators. Here we have the sum of the ladder operators, and here we have the difference of the ladder operators. And when we have the difference, we have an i. These guys are both Hermitian operators. That's because if we take the Hermitian adjoint of this sum over here, this a dagger is going to become a, and this a is going to become a dagger. So they're just going to get swapped around. And the addition of these operators is commutative, so we get the same thing. We just get a plus a dagger. But what about down here? If we take the Hermitian adjoint of these guys, we're going to get a over here and a dagger over here. So we're going to have these guys swapped around. So that's going to introduce a minus sign. We're going to get a minus sign when we take the Hermitian conjugate. But luckily, we have this i over here. And when you take the Hermitian conjugate of this i, it turns into minus i. So we have a minus sign from here and a minus sign from here. And a minus times a minus makes a plus. So it actually gives back the same thing. So both of these guys are Hermitian operators, as we have just verified by writing them in terms of the ladder operators. Now, let's actually write the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics. So what is the, the Hamiltonian in classical mechanics? It is this form over here. That's the most important form that we got from all of this classical mechanics work that we did. Now let's turn these guys into operators and write that below. So what we have is the Hamiltonian is equal to q hat squared over 2c plus phi hat squared over 2l. So all I've done is I've just put hats on all of these quantities. This is reasoning by analogy. We're just uh, taking our classical understanding and we're moving it into quantum mechanics. We're translating it into the language of operators. Now what we can do is we can take these relationships over here and we can substitute them into this expression for the Hamiltonian. So let's do that. What are we going to get over here? What happens when we square q? Well, when we square this q, we're going to have i squared, which is minus 1. So that's going to give minus 1 on 2c. 
And then we're going to also square this square root. So that's just going to leave h bar on 2z. And then we need to square the difference of a dagger and a. So we have a dagger minus a all squared. Now let's do this term. We're going to have plus 1 on 2l. And we're squaring this. So the square root disappears. We have h bar z over 2. And then we have a dagger plus a. It's the sum squared. So this comes from squaring this expression. And when we square q, we get this expression over here. And that's where this minus sign comes from. It's this i, because i squared is minus 1. Now let's rearrange this slightly. We can factor out, there's, there's a 2 and a 2, which turns into 4. We can factor out this h bar over 4. That's going to give us the following. h bar over 4. And what are we going to have over here? Let's actually, let's swap these guys around. Let's consider this term first. Here we have l. So we're dividing by l. So we have 1 over l. But this impedance can actually be written as the square root of l over c. So that's what this z is over here. This z is the square root of l over c. It's that ratio. Now what we can do is we can multiply this by the sum squared. We have a dagger plus a squared. And that takes care of this term over here. We factored out h bar on 4, and we've taken care of 1 over l times z. Now let's subtract this term. So we have to subtract minus 1 over c times the square root of, what do we have over here? We have the reciprocal of z. So we have 1 over z. So that's actually the square root of c over l. Over here, we had the square root of l over c, and now we have the square root of c over l. And then we just have the difference. We have a dagger minus a all squared. So that's what we got. So this is still looking like a bit of a mess, but we can clean this up a bit. We can notice that over here we have 1 over l, and over here we have l in the square root in the top. If we bring this l inside, it's going to turn into 1 on l squared. And one of those factors of l are going to cancel, so we're going to get 1 over the square root of lc. And that's exactly where we, what's going to happen over here as well, because we have c occurring here outside on the bottom, and we have c on the inside of the square root in the top. So we move this inside, that's going to give 1 on c squared, one of those c's is going to cancel, and we'll have 1 over the square root of lc. So we can pull that common factor out the front. That's going to give us the following. We're going to have h bar on 4 times 1 over the square root of lc. So that's a common factor. Both of these guys give the same result. Now let's expand these terms inside the brackets. So first we're going to get a dagger squared. Then we're going to have a squared. Then we'll have a dagger a, and then a, a dagger. So that's from this term over here. Now let's deal with the minus sign. Over here, this is going to give us a minus. So we're going to have minus a dagger squared. And then we'll have another minus a squared. And over here, we're going to get double minuses. When we do a mixed term, when we multiply this by this and this by this, we're going to have a minus sign. But we also have a minus sign at the front. So we're going to have minus times minus, which is plus. So we'll have plus a dagger a, then plus a, a dagger. And I'll close the brackets over here. So have a look at all of these terms that we found. So these terms have come from expanding the sum squared. And then when we expand the difference squared and subtract it off, we get all of these terms over here. So we get a minus, a minus, and then a plus, and then a plus. These pluses are actually double minuses. We have a minus sign from out here and a minus sign from the inside when we do mixed term multiplication. So let's see what we can cancel. a dagger squared cancels with minus a dagger squared. a squared cancels with minus a squared. These terms are exactly the same as these, these terms over here. We have a dagger a, a a dagger, and then we have a dagger a, a a dagger. So we can group these guys together. We have two copies, and we can factor out a factor of 2. And that factor of 2 is going to combine with this 1 over 4, and that's going to give us h bar over 2. And what about this 1 over square root of LC? Well, that's exactly the same as omega. So we can write this in a far more condensed form. 
That is h bar omega over 2. That's all of this stuff out here. So I've pulled that factor of 2 from the inside. And that's canceled with one of the factors of 2 inside this 4. And then I have a dagger a plus a a dagger. So that's what I've got over here. And these are not the same term. These operators are not commutative, as we know from this commutation relation. Now let's actually use this commutation relation to write this in a slightly different form. Let's write this underneath. So we still have h bar omega over 2. And I'll keep a dagger a exactly the same. I don't want to change that. But I do want to change this term, a a dagger. Where did that come from? Well, we had an a a dagger over here and an a a dagger over here. And that gave us a 2 times a a dagger. And then we factor that 2 out. So this term over here, I want to swap. I want to swap these guys so that I have the same combination over here. But if I swap these guys around, I'm going to have to consider the commutation relation. So have a look over here. We have a a dagger minus a dagger a. If I move this to the other side of the equation, what I get is a dagger a plus 1. So all I have to do to swap these guys around is to add 1. So that's going to give me the following. I'm going to get a dagger a plus 1. So I want you to be comfortable with this step. These two guys over here are exactly the same as a a dagger. That's because a a dagger is the same as a dagger a plus 1. That's using that fundamental commutation relation between the ladder operators. Now we have two copies of a dagger a. So we can group these guys together. That's going to give us h bar omega over 2 times 2 times a dagger a plus 1. And now we can bring in this factor of 1 half from outside. And that's going to give us h bar omega times a dagger a plus 1 half. And this is the form of the Hamiltonian from the quantum harmonic oscillator. So we can see that it's exactly the same. We have the same form of the Hamiltonian when it's written in terms of the ladder operators. And this we can actually combine together. We can uh, label that as the number operator. When you have a dagger times a, that is the number operator. But you got to keep, keep in mind that these are not the same ladder operators that we were dealing with when we had position and momentum. We've defined them in slightly different ways. Instead of mass, we have capacitance. And instead of k, which is uh, from Hooke's law, we have a combination of 1 over L. It's the reciprocal of this inductance. And instead of position and momentum, we have flux and the conjugate charge. So I want you to also remember that this capital Z over here is the same as the square root of L on C. That's the square root of L on C. And then when we take the reciprocal, it's the square root of C on L. So the takeaway message for this video is that we started with classical mechanics. We wrote down the Lagrangian in classical mechanics. We found the canonically conjugate coordinate. Then we used the Euler-Lagrange equation to find the equation of motion. And the Euler-Lagrange equation gave us a second order differential equation. And this is the one that we know from the simple harmonic oscillator. We used this uh, equation over here to define omega. And then we took the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian to get the Hamiltonian. And we wrote the Hamiltonian in terms of the charge and the magnetic flux. Then we also used Hamilton's equations to get the time evolution. Finally, with the classical mechanics part of this video, we looked at the Poisson bracket. And we found that the Poisson bracket of phi and q is equal to 1. And we also found, by analogy, that the commutator of phi and q is equal to i h bar. When you go from the Poisson bracket to the commutator in quantum mechanics, you have to introduce this factor of i h bar. And implicitly, there is an identity operator here. We could write out the identity operator as well. We also defined this commutation relation between the ladder operators, and we use that later in the video. We define the ladder operators in these uh, definitions over here. And then we used those definitions to derive uh, these expressions for phi and q in terms of the ladder operators. Then finally, we took the Hamiltonian, which was analogous to the classical Hamiltonian, and we substituted those definitions inside. And that gave us this familiar form of the Hamiltonian. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to take this form over here. We have a dagger a plus a a dagger, and we're going to substitute 
uh, these definitions inside, and then we're going to do the reverse process. And after that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some other Hamiltonians that are also very interesting. We're going to have a look at not just the LC circuit, which is a quantum harmonic oscillator, we're going to have a look at the transmon qubit and the dual mon qubit. And those are some very important physical systems that can be described in a similar way. This is just the beginning for describing a lot of physical systems that have applications in quantum computing. So make sure you find that video. It's also in the quantum mechanics playlist if you click over here.